Let's get started. Thank you everybody for joining our session, Leading Through Change, UBC Leaders Talk Incorporating Gen AI and Preparing for the New Reality. My name is Raymond Lawrence. I'm an academic director for the Center of Teaching and Learning, and I will be the moderator for this panel. We have exceptional leaders from UBC who are gonna express their thoughts and opinions on how Gen AI affects their careers, their, their leadership, and a variety of other aspects. So we're looking forward to a very interesting discussion. Before we begin, just wanna talk about a safe uh, space for us all to talk. UBC prides itself on having a respectful environment. We are fostering discussion. We may not always agree with each other on what opinions or our thoughts are, but we always wanna have the mode of thinking that we appreciate everybody's opinion. We interact with each other in a respectful way, and that's how we advance forward as an institution and as individuals. Now I'd like to do the land acknowledgement. Many of you are situated at UBC Vancouver, which is the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Myself, I am joining you from UBC Okanagan, which is on the traditional unceded territory of the Silks, Okanagan Nation. And we respect and humbly acknowledge our presence on those lands in a spirit of reconciliation going forward. Next slide, please. Now, before I introduce the panel, which I'm gonna do in a second, I'm just gonna talk what we're trying to achieve here. A lot of these sessions in Celebrate Learning Week have talked about how Gen AI impacts us as instructors, and that's vitally important. But what we're gonna see here is also some discussion on how it impacts other parts of our lives. Maybe you're in a leadership role, or maybe you just in, in, trying to understand how it might have personal impacts on you. And even though we're at the, I would say peak of hype or fear with Gen AI and the cycle of a new technology. I'd like to kind of frame it that this isn't new. If we look back even our, our recent past, year 2000, internet, Amazon, Google, we fundamentally changed how we do many things in our lives, whether it's shopping, banking, or how we interact with people. You think about 2010 and the years after, Mobile phones, we now take it for granted that we have a phone in our pocket, we're always on, and how that has impacted our lives, both professionally and personally. And of 2020, with COVID, as an institution, as individuals, we were now forced into online teaching, into different ways of interacting with each other as instructors. We are in a Zoom meeting right now. This is some of the legacy that came from those times. And I would also say during those years, especially in COVID, many people took that opportunity to reassess their life and broadly and see what's important to them. Now, we don't really know where Gen AI is going to take us in the future, but I would say similar to the other transformational technologies, it'll follow a path. We'll figure it out, but we're all in that space right now trying to figure out what that means to us. And so I'm very excited to hear from our panelists to see how they've reflected on what it's mean to them so far and what maybe they're looking forward to or expecting in the future. So with that, I wanna start off by introducing our panelists. Our first panelist is Christina Hendricks and I encourage Christina to introduce herself. Thank you. Yes, hi, thank you, Raymond. Uh, I'm Christina Hendricks. I am currently the Vice Provost and Associate Vice President Teaching and Learning Pro Tem on the Vancouver campus, a role I've been in for 10 months now. Um, previous to that, I was CTLT Academic Director also at Vancouver, and I'm a Professor of Teaching and Philosophy. Been here for um, 20 years now. Kind of amazing. Thanks. Thank you, Christina. Our next panelist is Dr. Ainsley Rouse. Thanks, Raymond. Um, so my name is Ainsley Rouse. I'm the Associate Director for Academic Integrity in the Office of the Provost on the Vancouver campus. So in that role, I lead the Academic Integrity Hub, which is a central hub supporting academic integrity and academic misconduct for faculty and students. In terms of my background, I have a PhD in the humanities and taught um, in the United States and worked in Switzerland and here in Canada. So happy to be here. Thank you, Ainsley. Our panelist is Heather Berenger. Heather? 
Thanks, Raymond. Um, my name is Raymond Zett, Heather Berenger. I'm the Associate Provost for Academic Operations and Services at uh, the UBC Okanagan campus, working in the Office of the Provost and Vice President of Academic. And uh, my background is as a librarian. So I'm a lapsed librarian. I like to say I was the chief librarian at UBC Okanagan for about 10 years uh, and then moved into this role in the provost office where I have a very diverse portfolio of different kinds of projects, um, lots of them kind of strategic priorities and trying to advance those. Um, one of those is to liaison enterprise IT. Another is to think about experiential education. Uh, another is to think about open educational resources. So. Uh, uh, it's interesting to imagine how all of these things link together uh, and might be influenced by or to influence uh, generative AI and, and how we think about that in our institutional context. Thank you very much, Heather. Dr. Elisa Bani Asad. Hey, um, good pronunciation, Raymond. That was that was great. Um, it's a very tricky name. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. It's lovely to be here. Thanks, Raymond, for um, for hosting this panel. Um, my name is Elisa. I'm uh, the Acting Academic Director of the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology at UBC Vancouver. I'm also uh, the it, regularly the Deputy Academic Director of Center for Teaching and Learning and Technology, um, looking at uh, things like Institute for Scholarship of Teaching and Learning and um, the Center for Integration of Teaching and, and um, Research and uh, various other items in the portfolio. And I'm also a faculty member in computer science and I'm just gonna try and make my phone stop dinging. So sorry, everybody, that was really loud. Um, so yeah, that's, so yeah, regular faculty member in computer science, professor of teaching in, uh, in software engineering. Thank you so much, Elisa. And our fifth panelist is Jennifer Burns. Jennifer. Hi everyone. I am the uh, Chief Information Officer and Associate Vice President for Information Technology for UBC. And so in that role, I'm accountable for uh, technology delivery across the university. Um, and that includes things like governance and policy and as well as the operations of the uh, central IT unit. Um, and in my role, I work really closely with Heather and Christina and Elisa um, and Raymond on delivery of um, technology and teaching and learning and really trying to understand how my academic colleagues need services to work and, and partnering with delivering uh, with them in delivering some of these services. Um, with relation to um, uh, generative AI, uh, myself along with Simon Bates were first tasked to co-lead the institutional response. Um, and because of the academy, we all love more people at the table uh, to, to collaborate and Simon very quickly went off on his admin, his admin leave for a full year. Um, Christina and Heather and um, uh, Bouchon Gopalini from uh, the Vancouver Provost Office were all kind of roped in uh, to this adventure with me on really understanding what the implications were going to be uh, for UBC, both in the teaching and learning and the administrative space and how we needed to respond to be able to support um, our academic colleagues in making decisions about the use of um, AI in, in the classroom and uh, elsewhere. And so I think it really interfaces um, with my approach to technology because for, uh, for me, I, I sort of fell into technology accidentally. I did not start out as a, as a technologist or the computer science background. I actually have a business background and uh, marketing. And so um, when I entered into tech, the, the tech space, it really was from the perspective of the marriage of uh, how technology should be supporting institutional strategy. And so when we look now at this latest set of technologies, while somewhat different, there's also a lot of similarities in how we think about it, how we govern it, and uh, how we try and adapt to it. It's just at light speed compared to the normal uh, pace of things. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for your background and your participation. Our goal here is to get just some discussion and to understand some of the thought processes that our leaders have went through. And I, we have some scripted questions that they have had some thoughts about, but I really appreciate as a community, if you have questions to ask, let's make this interactive. Post them in the Q&A session. We'll ask the leaders their thoughts on questions that you have. And I'm really looking forward to see what the community 
has on their minds as well related to generative AI. But let's start off with one of the questions uh, that we have hopefully had the, been prepared for, which was what was the greatest leadership challenges as Gen AI emerged? And we're gonna start in the order that you were introduced. So Christina, what were some of the greatest leadership challenges as Gen AI emerged for you in your leadership role? Thanks. Um, so this would have been, you know, as we all remember, it'll probably be burned in our memories, November 2022. Um, I was academic director of the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology at that time, which is where uh, Elisa is at the moment. Um, and I remember spending a very large amount of time reading articles and watching videos, joining email listservs of other academics and leaders who were um, trying to figure out what was going on, and just basically soaking in as much information as possible, testing out the tools, right? We were all doing that. Um, at the same time as leading a unit who um, was one of the, the areas that was responding to uh, this emergence of generative AI. There were multiple areas responding, but CTLT was certainly one. Um, and I remember thinking, okay, we need to put something out quickly, but it was the challenge, well, there are multiple challenges, but one was trying to get something out quickly while everything was changing, right? So, First, you got to learn it all, right? Well, you can't, but you, you, you learn uh, as much as you can. Then you start trying to put out resources, advice, guidance, um, while, uh, you know, months and weeks go by and things change over time. So, you know, how do you put out guidance that's going to be resilient for the future? Um, that was very challenging. Um, getting some guidance up and running as soon as possible around privacy and data security, that was really uh, a challenge because um, that was one of the main things on my mind at the at that time, among many others, um, working with uh, uh, folks from privacy and security on, on what we could say. Um, and I think another challenge was feeling like I needed to understand the technology enough to be able to be effective as a leader of the unit that was helping to respond to this and also as someone who was participating in uh, workshops and, and leading things um, to try to help other faculty members. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a philosopher. It's not, this is, I'm not a computer scientist. I didn't really have a background in this and trying to find information that was at a sweet spot between super high level, really overview, doesn't really give me enough information, or really technical, and I just didn't have the background to understand it, finding information in that in between, right, where it was like, okay, I understand enough of how this works to understand its capabilities, its um, limitations, and to some degree how it worked, because I, I think that was really critical to be able to support um, faculty, staff, and students in, in uh, guidance and understanding how they should think about these tools and how they should or should not be used. Um, Another challenge at that time and continued to be over time is, is how not to, I don't know how best to put this, how not to let this change kind of take over all of the other priorities that exist at the institution because, because it, it was very front and center. It was big, still is um, rapid change. Um, and though it's new and in many ways quite urgent, um, when something like this comes up and it's a big change, it can sort of take our focus away from, from other things that also uh, need to be happening, other priorities related to teaching and learning. There are lots of really crucial priorities and, and things that, that uh, we should be working on and just trying to consciously keep that in mind and ensuring that the other activities uh, continue to get my attention as a, as a leader and, and emphasis. Um, so those were some of the, the challenges back back at that time, um, but happy to speak more about other things later. Uh, really appreciate that, Christina. Some of those threads, I think many people would agree with. You're trying to be a leader, but you have other things to do. And Gen AI is just one of those things and trying to grab a hold of what that actually is. We're all going through that, whether we're leaders or whatever role we're at in the institution. So thank you very much for that. Ainsley. What's your thoughts on the greatest challenges that you saw in terms of leadership? 
Um, yeah, happy to share. And I certainly relate to a lot of what Christina said, um, having worked closely with her last year in her past role and also throughout this year in, in her current role. I also relate to um, approaching this issue with a humanities background, which I think is a really good exercise to have in a role that to a certain extent requires some translation. Um, so I've tried to see that as a positive versus a, a negative or putting me in a, in a deficit in some way. Um, but what I want to bring here is the perspective really at the intersection of both of the AIs, so generative AI and academic integrity, um, and the perspective of, of leading an emerging academic integrity hub on a very large campus. Um, and I would say that in many ways, the biggest challenge was also the biggest opportunity in this space. Um, academic integrity, as we all know, was a very early focal point or a very early entry point to this topic, end of 2022, early 2023. And it required fast action as well as agility uh, to provide orientation in a field that was new to many of us. The topic also in very early days had um, a strong regulatory inspiration to it. Um, and I know that over the past year, there has been an intentional push to, to balance that tone with one of opportunity as well. So it's not to negate the opportunities that are presented, but just to really create more balance. So if we take things back to sort of late 2022, early 2023, I will say that the fact that provost's offices on both campuses both had academic integrity teams in place to deal with that corner of Gen AI was a tremendous plus. It gave us agility to pull together information quickly. I'm referring here to a very early um, FAQ on the academic integrity website, which for, for many months was one of the, the only sort of um, guidance documents that was available. And it included very early messaging around not all use of Gen AI is misconduct. And, you know, it's an instructor or program level decision around if, how, and when to use Gen AI. But I really relate to what Christina said in the sense that there was an urgency to have more and to have all the answers very quickly beyond this basic guidance. And we often and heard many times when the university would take a position on this, where that was the position on this for now, and that this would reveal itself to be a much longer process that, as Jennifer has pointed out, um, involves all parts of the university, not just the, the corner where I work. So what I would say just to sum it up is developing strategies to deal with short term and urgent requests in something that is a very, very long game. Thank you so much, Ainsley. Fabulous point. Heather, your thoughts? I tried many times to get off this panel in various ways so that I wouldn't have to share anything. Um, and Ultimately, I decided I was going to come at it maybe from a different perspective or a different take than some of the others and thought, I'm just going to run with that and, and bring it uh, today. It's a beautiful day here. So it's good. Good. The sun is encouraging me uh, and say that um, I think the greatest leadership challenge for me when this emerged was that I was a atrocious leader in the face of it. I hid from it. I tried to pretend that it wasn't happening. Um, thank goodness for Ainsley and her team and our team here, Kirsten, and our academic integrity group, because um, we were seeing very quickly all of those uh, faculty members being extremely frustrated about how they were ever going to detect this. Uh, many, many students being absolutely terrified that they would accidentally commit academic misconduct uh, and not knowing what to do about that. And I felt at the intersection of that saying, I have no answers for you. I actually don't even know what you're talking about. I didn't even log into ChatGPT until it had been around for probably six or seven months. Um, and I knew that I knew about um, because I was hiding. I was far too scared to wade into the conversation. Um, I still remember that uh, my colleague, Christina's predecessor in the role and, and returning to it, I know, Simon, um, Bates in the Vancouver campus contacted me one day and said, so uh, we've been asked to uh, tackle the, the um, institutional response to Gen AI, Jennifer Burns and I, and I really think the Okanagan needs to be present at that conversation. So you should probably think about being a co-chair on the generative AI steering group for the institution. And I said, absolutely, positively not. There is no way I'm getting involved in this. I don't know anything about it. You should go ask Raymond Lawrence. So Raymond, you dodged a bullet, my friend, um, because Simon said, you know, you, you really 
need to think about it. Anyway, I said yes. And here's where the challenge then I'm going to say um, came for me. Number one, I did not feel comfortable representing the views of everyone in the Okanagan on some kind of a task force as a chair that was out, clearly out of my depth. Uh, and I felt constantly that I was uh, not meeting anyone's expectations, not mine, not those of my constituents, not those of students who I felt I was letting down pretty significantly. Um, and hearing repeatedly from faculty, uh, and I resonate, what Christina said resonates with me, please give us guidance, please give us guidance, and being able to provide none, except to say, don't use those detectors because they don't work, <laughs> Uh, be, being the only guidance we had available, I, I'll just yeah sum this up by saying I felt like probably the world's biggest imposter taking on the role and uh, that my greatest leadership challenge was I felt like absolutely not a leader in that moment at all. Heather, thank you so much for being honest and authentic like that. I think that sort of voice really helps people because if we're honest with ourselves, no one really knows exactly what's going on with AI. It's so diverse. No one can predict the future either. And I really like the messaging, like a lot of our instinct with new things come are to avoid and to hide. And one of the things we're trying to do as part of this Celebrate Learning Week is, is acknowledge, yeah, that's okay. But as faculty and instructors, we can't, we have to get past that. We have to be in engaging because our students are engaging. We have to engage as well. So thank you so much for sharing that. Elisa, what's your thoughts on your leadership challenges for Gen AI? Um, so... I kind of came to this last year. So I've been in this role for not quite a year. Um, I sort of started in the role and then very quickly realized there was a whole bunch of stuff that I, sh you know, should probably just hop to and do. Um, and a lot of that was just, you know, probably things that Christine had actually said, you need to do these. And then in the world of onboarding, I had heard of fraction of the things that I should really be running with quite quickly. And, but it took me like a beat to be like, oh, and this is actually a really, really big one. I think the big challenge was, um, you know, hearing from faculty, the fear that they had around so many aspects of, of this technology. Of course, the very first one was academic misconduct. That was the instant reaction. But then the, how do we even do it? how do I use it in my classes without breaking the law? And like, oh, well, we can't do it like that. <laughs> I can't use it in my classes without breaking the law. Or, you know, you can be careful. But um, so I think the biggest leadership challenge was for me was really coming into a new role um, where I didn't, I had not been a leader before and suddenly needing to lead a large team in some action. And that was, and, and, and not knowing how to, make things really happen at UBC. So I think I'd had, you know, a few inroads into accomplishments here and there that gave me a bit of confidence that maybe I could, I could try and make some progress. It was very, di a very different experience to suddenly be saying to like, you know, 85 or a hundred people, depending how you count, okay, we have to move in this direction, even though we are very busy and we have to make some things, even though we're very busy, and how do we do that? And it's been a, a tremendous um, growth experience for me trying to um, balance these competing forces. Like, yes, there's this, this big new area. And yes, there are things that we need to keep doing as well. Um, but in terms of generative AI, it was really trying to understand what the space was and understand what my responsibility in my role was within that space. So I could imagine it's very easy to sort of point over there and say, I think what Jennifer should be doing is spending $70 million on a LLL. I have some advice for you, Jennifer. You know, I, like I have lots of advice for everybody else, but really taking accountability of like, what is my job today in this? And so what, you know, CTLT kind of looked at it as a group and we realized, okay, our lane is very much faculty development. We need to quite quickly provide resources to help calm people down and get people moving with it and, you know, in various formats. And so that was the big challenge was really trying to understand how we fit into the bigger leadership challenge and, and how we could do our jobs, basically. Thank you. Thank you for your insights. Jennifer, your insights on the question. Yeah, and I think so many good things have been said. And I really want to give a shout out to Heather for voicing everybody's in internal inner voice that comes up on all of this stuff. Because 
what I kind of figured out fairly quickly was nobody actually knows. And I was talking to colleagues and, you know, uh, across Canada and the U S and, and there's, there's just everyone, everybody was kind of in the same boat and struggling. And surprisingly, I find that UBC is often ahead, which is, which is like, wow, we're ahead and we still don't know. But, you know, I think uh, the biggest issue for, for me was balancing opportunity and risk. So as CIO, I often spent a lot of time in these spaces more often lately in the risk space because of cybersecurity and privacy concerns and, and so on. So when a new technology comes out like this, the challenge for me was the speed at which it hit was to take a step back and say, okay, we can't create a whole new set of policies and practices and governance around this. It's just moving too fast. And our governance does not move at this speed, but we have to find a way to create frameworks that people can work within because they're out there doing things and how do we give them the tools to make good decisions? In IT, there's an instinctive reaction when something like this happens, which is just to lock it all down. Just tell people they can't use it, ban it from the network. I, I don't tell you how many times I heard leaderly people say, well, just cut, cut it off the network. I'm like, you can't, like cell phones, smartphones, like how are you gonna, you know, what, no, you can't. So it's, it's about, give, you know, at a leader level, like how do we give people the tools within existing governance frameworks, you know, and ways to make really good decisions. And I think that's still a challenge. Um, the other thing I'm seeing now, which is um, a challenge, is that it's still evolving and evolving very, very quickly. And so now we're getting into video and deep fakes and all these things. So now we have to expand our thinking beyond just don't, don't get it to write an essay for you, but maybe don't get it to submit your video project either, or, you know, other types of things. And what I'm also seeing is it's created a new awareness and resurgence around machine learning and other types of AI that was kind of hidden in the background. And now it's getting married to generative AI to create whole new combinations of capabilities. And we're starting to get into agent-based AI and all those things. So it's, it's moving beyond the things that I was originally worried about. And now I have to worry about you know, these virtual assistants that are starting to crop up and, and how do we manage that at an institutional platform level so we don't have 15 different versions of that and supporting people. So for me, it's about um, allowing the institution to grow and explore and innovate and learn by doing in a way that also balances the really serious risks that I see around ethics and privacy and security and accessibility. And, and you know, how does this align with UBC's values and making sure that we have good guidance there, even for ourselves, because, you know, we have to somehow marry this to our values as an institution and as a society. So big, big questions while we're dealing with the small questions or the smaller questions as well. Thank you so much. There's some very interesting points there. One I'll just pick up on is this issue of speed. Everything is moving so quickly, so the natural reaction is to try to respond as quickly. But sometimes it's better to slow down, reflect, and make sure you get it right. I know many of the community want fast answers. We all do. But sometimes a fast answer that's wrong is not as good as a little bit more reflective answer that's more useful to the community. So thank you, everyone, for your responses. We're going to go in reverse order for the next question. So Jennifer, you're going to lead on this one. And the question was basically two sides. What was the most surprising thing and what was the most concerning? So this could be from the leadership perspective, but if you want to also throw it out uh, from a personal perspective, or however you want to interpret that question in terms of Jen and I, what was the most surprising to you and what was the most concerning to you? And Jennifer, you're up. Uh, I think what was most surprising was the degree with which people wanted to embrace it. So, you know, oftentimes we spend a lot of time in this new technology talking about change management and how to help people use things and how to support them through the change. In this case, it was sort of the opposite. Like people were in there, they were wanting to use it. And I remember our very first generative AI steering committee where we took a poll and we said, how aggressively should UBC move to adopt this tool? 
And there was some pretty conservative voices in there from my past experience in terms of the use of technology. And the answer was moderately aggressively, which I was like, wow, that was, that's really interesting. Like this is new for us. And it's kind of moved from there to where I am seeing the innovation, um, not necessarily at the institutional level, because we've been a bit slower at that level, because you have to be for the exact reasons you pointed out, Raymond. but it's more at the individual faculty member level, how they're using it and want to use it and, and moving towards it. Um, so I think um, that was surprising. It's also been surprising how good it is and how useful it is. Like I was doing a mentoring session the other day and I said, and they were asking me about how do I tell my story and how do I put things and how do I prepare for a presentation? And one of the things I said, use chat GPT or use something else to say, this is what my presentation is about. Can you coach me on my delivery and so on? And it, and, and it actually, because I've used it that way and it's quite valuable. So it won't replace a human, um, but it certainly can help us in our work, do our work better. And so that, that has surprised me. Um, I think what I find most concerning is the focus on the technology first, rather than the focus on the outcome that we're looking for and about the boring governance, risk management, um, you know, equitable access issues. And less so at UBC, because at UBC we've had this Gen AI steering committee and we've got our subcommittees now they are looking at these really important aspects. We've got the uh, principles that were just released on the use of generative AI at UBC and um, the teaching and learning folks led by Christina are putting forward the teaching and learning uh, guidelines. Uh, but as I um, have been doing a lot of work with Educause and folks outside of UBC, so across Canada and the US, uh, everybody's moving at speed to throw up LLMs and without necessarily knowing why and how they're going to be used and what for and the true cost and not just financial cost, but sustainable cost. And I'm seeing duplication of things that are available in other ways that, that we're, you know, institutions are throwing it up and, and just to try it out. I think that's good, but doing it at its scale without understanding some of the broader pieces around it, without having policies, without having guidance, that worries me. I think we have to innovate, but maybe small scale innovation coupled with good governance and frameworks to support that and to support the right behaviors. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate the answer. Elisa. Um, well, so okay, so it's what's sort of surprising and what is concerning. Is that the the prompt? Um, I think what was the most surprising was how good it was immediately and then how much better it got so quickly. Um, I think, you know, Christina and I were talking about a resource that she and the team had made really early on, and it was like there were whole swathes of it that needed to be edited away because it was like, don't worry, Jenna, I can't do this. And it's like, oh no, we can now. Um and so that was, I think that was the most surprising was just the speed at which the technology was moving. I think I wasn't prepared for, I think I wasn't emotionally prepared for technology to move quite that quickly. Um, and I think the most concerning for me um, through the leadership lens is that maybe we're thinking, I mean, I don't know, again, like this is very, like, this is very much me saying, oh, I think what you should be thinking about is, so it's very easy for me to say, but, um, but I feel like it, I, I feel like it would be a good idea for us to think really far out. So um, realizing that we can't know what all the possible futures are like, but we do know that there will be an impact. And we do know that our jobs will change. Like, you know, Jennifer, you said it won't replace a person. It kind of will though, right? Like it probably, probably there will be at least large portions of people's jobs that change dramatically. Computer science education, going to change hugely. Our whole curriculum is going to need to change in the next couple of years. Raymond, you can uh, appreciate that as well. I mean, it is absolutely the case that we're going to need to do this huge reckoning of like, what are we exactly teaching people? What are the skills that are out there that are needed in industry, in the world that are completely different now? Because we have this very smart helper sort of sitting around fallible, but very clever helper. Um, so I, I think what concerns me is that um, I feel like more thought needs to be given, maybe more space needs to be given to those longer term 
thoughts. How will education change? What opportunities are there for educational change? Um, how will course delivery change? How will assessment delivery change? Uh, and how will our fields, the disciplines themselves and the, the pedagogy within the disciplines, how will those change? And, and I, that's, that's really what I find concerning is like, wow, there's a lot of work to do and we need to, we need to make some space to do it. Thank you. So if I want to sum up instructors and researchers, we have to question everything again, how we teach, how we do things at university. That's good. We're, we're here at university to inquire. So, but it's definitely a concerning challenge. Heather, your thoughts. Um, so I, I'm going to say surprising, not surprisingly, I'm going to have more to say about being concerned, but um, surprisingly, what, in terms of what was most surprising, I'm surprised how scared I felt when I realized exactly what Elisa just said, how fast this was moving. Like I've seen the Terminator. I've seen like space, the Odyssey movie where Hal takes over and like people die. It's not good. And I was surprised how quickly my brain went to like the robots are coming and they might not be very nice. Like they, it, this could happen really fast. We won't know what to do about it. And guidelines and principles for risk mitigation aren't going to do much when the Terminator shows up. Like that's going to be really bad. So I was surprised how scared I got about this already feeling out of control. I've acknowledged by not being a leader. Um, and, and I think like I've gotten that under control. I'm usually a pretty chill person, but there were just some some nights, some sleepless nights for sure. What I'll say about the concerning part is, is a little bit of a short story, if I can. And, and Christina will have taken this journey with me and will know maybe even what I'm about to say. But um, we had the privilege of being invited to speak about the guidelines and principles for risk mitigation at um, the I Speak meeting, which is our Indigenous Strategic Plan Executive Advisory Group. Um, and we went in there, you know, kind of, I think, unprepared a little bit for some of what the feedback was that we would receive. Uh, and I think it was such meaningful, deep, valuable and important feedback we got from the group around where our Indigenous communities are, are thinking about um, the advent of this Gen AI. There's a random phone in the room ringing. I'm sorry, it's not mine. Uh, and I think the part of that that I walked away with that was the most difficult for me was somebody saying, what is this going to do to the nature of human relationships? What is it going to mean that before, when you had questions, you used to go to talk to people, and now maybe you're going to go talk to a machine? And how are relationships between people going to be impacted and affected by this, by the nuance that comes from human communication and engagement, by um, the learnings we have coming from our elders, what happens when those are not the ways we are communicating necessarily? Um, and I actually went home and cried. Uh, and it was very much about that uh, and thinking about the potential loss because I, I did reflect back to COVID. And while there's been lots of wonderful things and Zoom is a huge convenience and I benefit from that, there was a time where this conversation would have been happening in person and not as many people could have attended potentially and probably, but I don't know how this conversation would have been different in that way of of thinking and learning and knowing and engaging and i i mourn it a little but i'm also excited for the possibilities that have that are there are to make this maybe a little less sad um and add a bit of levity because i'm known to want to do that uh i also felt that my hypothesis and fear on this was somewhat justified when and someone's bot showed up at the meeting to take notes because they were unavailable and it announced itself in the room as so and so's bot who was there to take. So I like the possibility that maybe I'm not going to have to go to meetings anymore. I can just send my robot to take notes for me, um, though my opinions will then potentially not be represented well by bot Heather. That is all. We're going to put a positive spin on some of the fear there. I love it. That's fantastic. Ainsley, what do you think about uh, uh, your perspective, surprising and concerning? I, I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, <laughs> um, just because the, the humor um, of some of the parts, but I, I, in terms of what is most surprising, I'm going to say something that's not particularly original. Um, and if you have already said already, for me, it was the speed of adoption of the technology. And just to reflect something that Jennifer said, it wasn't just the speed, it was also um, the enthusiasm. 
And Raymond, you talked about sort of us being in the height of fear. And I, I thought that was interesting. because Sometimes I, I feel like we don't see enough of that. I think I, all I see is enthusiasm at times. Um, so I would say absolutely just speed, but with speed, and those who know me know that I'm a detail oriented person, um, with speed comes the need to be very attentive to detail. And so I'm going to connect this to sort of what I find concerning, um, what I have found, what I continue to find concerning is sort of generally speaking, the potential that Gen AI tools have to cause harm. Um, more specifically, again, to reflect my own experience from where I sit in the university is, and this is not to privilege one way they cause harm over another way they cause harm, but it's the way that they have the potential to amplify what are existing concerns uh, in the area of academic integrity and academic misconduct around how students can be targeted, how students can be falsely accused. Um, and some of those issues are connected to sort of broader trends like you know, the campus climate that's created with the new technology and the fear that that creates or the existence of imperfect detection tools and then a responsiveness to the campus climate that I just mentioned in terms of adopting those where they're not going to provide the answer or the perfect solution. Um, and then also the fact that Gen AI tools represent as they represent for lots of different industries, something that can be taken up by existing indus industries that are already posing a challenge to higher education to make those bigger, faster, more productive, and more invasive. Um, so that, you know, we all know that UBC did not take up Turnitin's uh, AI detection tool in April, reaffirm that decision in August. But I think what I would sort of want to see moving forward and we we work on and what I would want to continue to, to continue to do is because detection tools are not banned per se, just ensuring that in light of these concerns, we continue to promote critical literacy around these detection tools for both students and for instructors, and that we're really open and transparent about risks. So for example, you know, saying things like, how could this be used against me? And what should I do if that happens? So I just hope that we can continue to be really active, really engaging, and really transparent around the topics where we do have concern and not hide from them. Thank you so much, Ainsley. Definitely top of mind for many instructors, ac academic integrity and the impacts AI have on that. So thank you for voicing that. Christina. Surprises, concerns? <laughs> sure. So the surprises are, a lot of them are very similar to what other people have mentioned. Um, I think right at the very beginning, I was surprised both at how well some of these tools worked and how terribly <laughs> some of the tools worked at the same time, right? So ChatGPT was the first one that really came to my attention and it could spit out a fairly decent essay in response to one of my philosophy um, essay prompts, essay assignments, uh, you know, obviously really quickly, and it was pretty good. Um, but in other respects, it was, of course, terrible. It made up citations, it had very formulaic responses. And so there was just this like ambivalence of, wow, it's amazing. And okay, it actually really still sucks. But things did improve over time, right? Um, and that was another surprise to how quickly that has happened as well as the absolute explosion in number of tools. So when um, we first uh, uh, put out a resource through the CTLT, which was um, working with a lot of amazing folks there who, who are still doing wonderful work um, on, on generative AI, uh, there, was, there was a list of like, here are some tools, you know, that do this or that or the other thing. And pretty quickly it was like, they're like, don't even try anymore because there are thousands, right? What's the point? Um, I guess another surprise has been, um, so uh, Jennifer alluded to this, I'm uh, co-chairing with a faculty member at Okanagan, Tamara Abel, and a student uh, at Vancouver, Camille Kanji, um, a generative AI and teaching and learning committee, advisory committee, we've been working on a set of guidelines for teaching and learning um, to really sort of support, amplify, and add a little bit to the guidance that already exists through uh, the CTLT and, and CTL and the Academic Integrity Hub, as well as what just uh, came out through the um, genai.ubc.ca um, website and principles. Um, and one thing that has been really surprising to me is how complicated that has been. 
I mean, I at first, literally when I started this job in, in July of 2023, thought, okay, I'll just draft some guidelines and then I'll take them out for consultation and we'll be done in a month, right? And then I thought, no, I think we should have more voices, right? It shouldn't just be me. And so let us let me bring some folks together. And of course, that always takes a little bit more time. But, but even then, um, sort of working through a lot of the really complex questions, um, it is they're complex, right? And they're more complex than I think I kind of realized. Uh, and it's been a super interesting um, process. And and I think, Raymond, I just want to echo what you said about, you know, we could have come out with something really quickly that might have been not great because we hadn't thought about all the complexities, right? And, and there's just been such rich discussion from a lot of you on this uh, panel. I think quickly concerning... Um, there's a lot of stuff that that uh, will show up in the guidelines around privacy and security. So, you know, how do we keep uh, data private that needs to be private? How do we avoid um, including confidential data um, bias and and so, and furthering systemic inequities? This was certainly something that was talked about at the very beginning, and still is the case that when you train on a bunch of data that um, you know, has existed in human society and it's all mostly in one language and, you know, you're, you're going to get the same biases that um, the, the data has, right? And so that has been worked on, but I think it's still there. Um, uh, I'm going to save one of these because I know it's going to come up in a question, but um, <laughs> uh, how to support faculty, staff, and students to use these tools um, ethically and responsibly in that short period of time was, was a real concern. And then something else that's going to come up in the guidelines that the Teaching and Learning Committee puts forward is around Indigenous data sovereignty, which was a really big topic um, in our discussions. And um, we're still consulting about it, but it's, a, it's another concern that I haven't heard as much out there sort of in the world, but has become really uh, important for us to discuss here at UBC. So I'll stop there for the moment. Great. Thank you everyone for answering that question. Just for the community, I encourage you to post some questions. We will answer them. Uh, one of the questions that's been put out is where do you think the future is going? That's one of the scripted questions for the end. So I'll save that one for the end. But one question I've seen in many panels in Celebrate Learning, Celebrate Learning workshops this week has been about the environmental sustainability, the society impact of AI. Just because the technology there and has some benefits, we can't forget about the potential negatives that this technology has. This is especially important with UBC's commitment to sustainability, responsible use. We have a variety of commitments that we have. So this is just open to anybody on the panel. What are your thoughts on how does UBC balance effectively those two things? Innovation, application of AI where appropriate, but also our values, which are critical to us as an institution. So any thoughts about that of the panel on environmental and societal impacts of AI? And anyone can go. I can go start. I think, I mean, I think this is, it's a really challenging and very important question. Um, and, and I've sort of struggled with this one myself too, um, in a number of areas, one of them being around sustainability, uh, because it, it, all this came about at the same time as UBC is like really working hard to address the climate emergency, right? And, and so we're trying to do a lot of things to reduce climate impacts as an institution. And yet here comes this, this technology that none of us necessarily um, asked for, right? But it's here. Some people might have, because I know some people were working on it. But um, but then what do you do, right? So what do you do about the fact that it takes a lot of water and it takes a lot of, of electricity? Um, and we know that. And I know there's also attempts to try to mitigate that and, and to, to work on the technology so that that is lessened. But at the same time, it's here. So how do we try to, how do we try to balance those things? And I, and I don't have a super good answer. Uh, at one point I thought, okay, well, let's just only use it for the things that we really need to use it for, right? If, if it's gonna have um, environmental impacts, Let's, let's think about the ways in which we're using it. That's one thought that I had. 
And then in terms of the other, you know, the, the societal impacts, um, I think letting folks know about uh, what I had mentioned around um, uh, bias and and uh, potentially supporting systemic inequities and and having that be in your mind and thinking about it and and, and um, reviewing outputs for those concerns to the best of your abilities is is one one way to address it and also talking with students about those as well right I don't have a super great answer but I saw Jennifer come off mute so go ahead Jennifer. Yeah, I think it's it's a huge problem. And and I actually read a Gartner uh, projection of by uh, 2027 um, that globally we're going to be rationing electricity because of the immense amounts of power being utilized here, but also EVs and, and the whole nine yards, right? So there, there are uh, some natural limiters, I think, coming in how we use these technologies. But a lot of it also comes down to our individual use. And I'm not putting this back on the individual because I think there's a, a broader uh, contextual thing we have to think about in this space. But right now we're all experimenting and many of us have used this chat GPT instead of a web search, which would take much less power, much less energy and so on. And so I think we have to think first about how we're using it, not to stop using it, but think about the context in which we're using it and is that the most efficient context but the second piece is you know when we think about our faculties who are our, our faculty members who are trying to solve the world's big problems these are tools that will help them be more efficient and fast in doing that and so if we can be thoughtful about the 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 cost benefit here is the way we're using it as operators going to benefit us in the way, in the output that we're getting. And I think there is an equation here um, that is beneficial, but we we also have to be collectively thoughtful in the use of it because it, it, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. The bottle is getting bigger, uh, the genie's getting bigger and and the, and the way we're using it is, is morphing and changing to become much, much more widespread and it will continue to do so. But there are some real implications. And so the onus is on us as humans to use it wisely to offset those costs, to create those benefits from for climate change and, and things like that. Uh, although, you know, because I think there's huge opportunity to solve some of the world's greatest challenges using this tool. Uh, but if we don't take advantage of that, then it's a lost opportunity and it's just creating more issues. Thank you, both of you, for your feedback. This is such a nuanced question, and there's no easy answer on what's acceptable use. Uh, and I just want to encourage other participants to post something in the Q&A. Uh, we will answer the questions throughout, and I'll switch to it as appropriate. Just want to highlight, you have a lot of people on this panel who are shaping AI at UBC, whether it's from the technology lens, from setting up guidelines, from academic integrity, if you want to have a voice and you haven't had a voice before, uh, I can we can answer some of these questions for these thought leaders uh, on campus. So please post questions as appropriate. Uh, I'm going to just post this because someone just quickly answered this. Uh, this is more of a technical question. What would become of data that was put into Gen AI when people are using it? And will the data automatically be property of the Gen AI? So this is a technical question. Does someone want to take that instead of me? Elisa, maybe I'll call you out on this. Sure, um, I, can, I can comment on it. Um, I think the ownership of something is actually very, a very murky legal space. Um, so I don't think it becomes the property of the tool that has taken it from your inputs. Um, but again, murky legal space. Uh, I I think it does mean that it now will be using it for its own purposes, and it may be returning it, giving a sense that it's it that it does own it. It may be misrepresenting that it does own it. Um, so yeah, if you put your um, your peer reviewed you know, paywalled paper into Gen AI to say, hey, explain this to me. You haven't really transferred copyright to the Gen AI tool, but it now has it and it will use it and re return it back to you. So um, 
so yeah, this is an area of, of concern for sure. If you do put things into Gen AI, you may be placing yourself at risk of violating someone's copyright. Again, copyright is a very um, tricky area of law or not tricky, but very nuanced and subtle. Um, but you know, that this is something where you could be placing yourself at risk by putting copyrighted materials into, into generative AI tools because it will, they will eat them and then spew them back out as though they own it. Thank so, you yeah. very much. Weird space. Yeah. The general message is user beware. You could try read the terms of use. That normally probably doesn't get you very far. My general assumption is if you provide it to it, it's going to use it in some form unless they say otherwise, and that's unlikely. So there's actually, Dale has posted a very interesting question about how we should, as educational institutions, align our curricular and policies, basically our courses, to reflect what AI does. But as leaders, I also want to do it a little bit different. So you might not be instructor, which you are going to change your course, but how would it change the people you're managing or what you expect them to do? Do you actually see an impact on your work or impact on people that you supervise? Because that also relates to the training aspect that most instructors think about. So open to anybody on the, the panel, how do you think AI impacts your work or the people you supervise? Thoughts? Go ahead, Jennifer. Well, you know, I have to, there's silence. I can't handle silence. Um, you know, I think my, and this ties into the next question that's there as well, but my, my guidance to my teams is use it, use it responsibly. There's, there's guidelines on what that looks like. If you have questions, ask me, but you know, we, I, I don't think we should be, um, telling our staff not to use it. So for me, it's like, if you're a communicator, I've had this conversation, use the tools to, um, you know, improve your ability to, to do work, to do more work, to do the work faster, to do work better, where appropriate, you know, reference that you're using it, especially if you're writing a briefing note or something like that, that someone's going to rely on to make a decision, let people know how you've used it. But that I think it's really important that we um, encourage our staff to make use of those tools. I make use of it, you know, to help me make better PowerPoint graphics and things like that. Like I, you know, so I've started to incorporate it in ways that, you know, um, are within what we've established as appropriate appropriate use principles and to make sure that, you know, we can start to uh, take advantage of, of some of the efficiencies there. But again, it's it's always coupled with responsibly. Make sure you understand. And I really like what Lisa said about read the terms of use, because I actually read the terms of use on these tools about how they're going to incorporate it. And I don't put anything into these tools that's confidential UBC data. So there's, you know, there's there's a framework around this, but but I think encouraging that use is important, not just for more efficient work or better work, but also for our staff in terms of their employability. Like I remember working uh, for an organization that had the old green screens, whereas the rest of the world was working on Windows and Office products. I mean, we were not doing our staff any favor by keeping them, you know, uh, back in the in the early days of computing in like the 80s. So I think it's really important for our staff in terms of their um, their their skills and their you know uh, feelings of, of valuable work to to encourage them to use these modern things. Thanks, Jennifer. Lisa, you can comment on the question too. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I think it's. I think it actually goes back to that environmental question as well um, about how do we decide how much of this to do, when to do it, when not to do it. And I think you know it comes back to the educative mission of the institution. We have to be educating people to prepare them for the world. This is what this is what we do. We do research and teaching and. We need to get people into the world who can be leaders and advancers of their respective fields. Um, so when we are you know, thinking about when do we employ these technologies? How do we employ them responsibly? How do we strategize about when to employ them? We just need to keep in mind that we do have a specific job to do around education. Um, so that's the same with 
the way that we consider our pedagogy, the way that we consider the research that we're doing, the way we invest in um, machinery around being able to do this work. Um, we need to incorporate all the things that we need to incorporate to maintain currency in teaching and learning and research. Um, so I think that's really what would drive it from my perspective is, is yeah, just those pragmatic concerns around like, like we're, we're living in the world and we have to educate students for the world and we have to do research about the world. This is, this is all true. Yeah, thank you both for those comments. Uh, really interesting. There was another question posted, which was, is generative AI going to devalue, uh, devalue knowledge, labor, and creative industries? And how does this fit with the university's role in labor knowledge? I'm almost curious to make that question personal. Do you think the AI would be coming for your jobs as leaders or people in your staff? Or is it not there or you don't think it will be there? So just comments about the AI impact uh, very specifically on these knowledge industries. Are there going to be fewer people or is it or is it just going to be adding to our productivity in a good way, not in a negative way? So just thoughts about that. Jennifer, you've already unmuted, so you have some comments, I'm sure. I've been joking with Gage that he just needs the CIO bot. Like, just, you know, shake the CIO bot. And what would Jennifer say? Because, you know, if I have actually thought, like, if you could ingest all the things that I say, and, um, at, you know, at the IT standups, these things, all of the things I've written, you could probably at any given time say, you know, I want to do this. What would Jennifer say? Well, she would say, you should try, you know, Write a briefing note, tell, give me the pros and cons and the options or whatever. So I think there's elements of my work that you could, uh, you know, ingest and and actually spit back a reasonable facsimile of what what I what some of the decisions I might make. Uh, I actually was listening to the Hard Fork podcast uh, the other day, and they were talking about a situation in market where a marketer who actually did that, that they had a client that was really hesitant to do anything without checking with their CEO first. So the marketing firm ingested all of the stuff that the CIO had written, said, talked about, and then said, look, we asked the CEO bot and it said X. And it was actually a reasonable uh, way of moving things forward because it gave similar answers. The problem is when you face new challenges, that is not encountered before. So, you know, if you ask me, if you ask it a question about IT governance, it's gonna pretty much say what I would say probably, maybe some better ways of saying it. But, you know, in this situation, like the generative AI, there was no path to follow, but no one else had done this before. It was a brand new situation. So I think it's the new and novel that is where the complexity comes in and where, where I think it's it will be at this point in time, hard to replace the human. Thank you very much. That's uh, Christina has a comment too related to this. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a thought. It was it was in some of my notes for one of the other questions that you may still ask Raymond. I don't know, <laughs> but um, uh, it it was around one of my fears, and um, the the fear is that that sense that there will be too much of a rush to save money by you know using AI and having fewer people. And so that that is a fear. It's a temptation. Um, I know a lot of people are worried about jobs that they either have now or students who are looking to get jobs in certain industries. And it is it is certainly something that I think about too. I have a teenager who wants to do computer science. What is his life going to look like? Um, and and for me in terms of teaching, like I, that's sort of where my you know, I guess original <laughs> uh, uh, position is in, is as an educator, and um, the thing that that I find really energizing and really exciting and really engaging about teaching is that human connection. Sort of going back to what Heather has said, is is being able to really connect with students work with them on their learning, learn from them as I, you know, continue to, to improve and change and grow. And um, the more I hand off interactions with students to something else, the less I'm going to feel that. And so there's this, like, I can see some value, right? I think, 
I think that there's some value in, you know, some questions could be answered about the syllabus by AI, right? It doesn't need to be me. But but I guess my fear is sort of more and more pulling away from those human connections. And, and so I think that's a, I may have answered one of the questions you're still going to ask, Raymond, but it, it seemed relevant. I, and that's perfectly okay. I think this discussion is even more interesting to answer some of the questions our community has. And that fear is very important to verbalize, uh, for sure. And the reason human in the loop is our theme is because it's not about technology. We're not teaching AI, we're teaching humans. AI may have a role to play, but we are teaching people and that has to be central to it. And I, I really thought Heather would be a good one to follow up on this as well, because she's already voiced concerns about the Terminator. So I don't know if she's like Jennifer, who might have a CIO bot or something replacing her. So I'm just curious what Heather's thoughts are on this particular thing. Go ahead. I actually, I did laugh, Erin, because you did anthropomorphize earlier by saying, is Gen AI coming for your jobs? And I thought, is it already coming for something? Like, is it already got an agenda? Is there a strategy? Because I could really use that. Um, but I, I think that um, what I would say here that I, and I am going to also dig in a little into my fear drawer um, for that question, not in a bad way, but around sort of what Christina said and riff off that, which is, I'm even going to say two things. I'm just going to go for it because I, I got the mic. Um, one is our students are expecting us to give them the tools they need to use these technologies when they go out in the workplace. And if they don't have them because their answer is, well, my prof didn't let me use it. Um, that's not a great look for the student, for us <laughs> as educators, for the institution. Um, so I think it is incumbent on us to start really listening to students about what it is they want to learn and need to learn in order to get into that next phase of their life. And then for us to help develop curricula. I, I noticed there's a question coming up, so I'm cheating a little. Um, but, but there is developing curriculum and thinking about how to integrate these in ways, even if we are a little scared, uh, maybe getting over that fear and baby steps about how we help the students get some of these skills to take with them when they go out because they they want them. Um, they don't, most that I've heard anyway are saying I don't I don't want to cheat, but I'm terrified to use it at all because what if it looks like I cheated because I cited it wrong and I did. I mean that's that's a totally fair concern for those students. The but the other thing I, I'm adding to this, Jennifer made a comment. I did write it down because I want to riff off that too, which is. Jennifer, you mentioned the awareness and resurgence of machine learning. That was a, a bit of a quote. Um, the other awareness and resurgence in machine learning that I'm starting to very frighteningly see is Scantron. We are a resurging to bubble sheets and pencils because that is an easier way to be sure that AI didn't get used, that we are not you know, challenged by that assessment problem that is really hard to solve. Not super excited to see Scantron make a resurgence. Um, I think we know that's not ideal and uh, I understand why and I completely get it. But again, is that in the best service of our students and what they need? I, I suspect not. So. That's a great point. I, I told the staff at CTL because we have only one Scantron machine for the whole campus, expect to be busy because the most AI resistant form of evaluation is unfortunately paper exams. So going back to very old school technology, but it is an interesting conversation uh, related to that. And there's a couple comments related to this. Uh, how do you think instructors or uh, programs should adapt to the fact that AI is here? What does this look like? And I don't know if Elisa might be the best person to take it, but also Ainsley from an academic integrity lens. What does that look like? That's probably one of the biggest questions that instructors are struggling with. My content is probably going to change, but also my assessment is going to change. So any comments from either of you two about that? Yeah, I have a lot to say, but Ainsley, why don't you go first and then I'll wax philosophical. There we go. Why don't I start? And then I'll pass it over to you. So I, I can certainly start about, you know, some of the things that might look different in, in a course. Um, not aside from the assessment is is making sure that expectations are very clear for students from instructors around when if and how these generative ai tools can be used so that would be putting that directly in the syllabus so that students know for that course and one of the things that's come up as we've been working on 
the guidelines that Christina alluded to earlier is also the, the experience of navigating potentially different levels of permissions in different courses. So I think just a general awareness that this could potentially look five different ways for a student in, in any given period of time and just making sure that they have enough information to to navigate that. Um, and then in terms of assessments, Elisa, I'll, I'll pass that over to you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think um, I think there are sort of different different levels of thinking about it. So there's the near future. Um, as Raymond said, everything's coming back to class or not everything, but lots of things are coming back to class because of the worries around, you know, how can we tell if you didn't get somebody else or a robot to do this for you? And the way we can do that is by watching you do it. Um, that's, you know, that's the very first line of defense, I think. Um, so I think assessments might change in the very close term by being more in person. Um, and then as the, the, as the horizon goes out further, I think more and more things should change and can change. Um, I think, you know, I, I actually think this is a huge educational opportunity for looking at the, the rules that we've always followed in terms of how we educate, um, you know, not to, not to get too, um, deep about it or anything, but, you know, we have as one of our core mandates, decolonization of our curriculum and, uh, and, uh, and all of our practices. And one of the reasons that we stick with the way we've always done things is because nothing much has changed to help us do it any differently. But now here is something huge that can help us do almost everything really differently. Um, we could actually get students to interact mostly with teacher bots and then have salon style conversations with very few students at once, for instance. We could completely change the way that we teach. It would require thinking completely differently about what our degree programs look like, what a course look like, looks like, what, what evaluations of teaching looks like. Um, it would require a lot of thought, but that is the work of decolonization actually, is looking at those industrial revolution style practices and saying, what can we upend here? And now this technology gives us so much what looks like people power to do certain types of tasks that we could use the actual people that we have to way better effect. Right now, a lot of us in education are doing a ton of busy work, doing things like checking for academic integrity or repeating the same answer to the same exact question on a forum all the time. And this takes countless hours. And so our capacity is so limited. So this technology could actually free us up to do things in a much more human way actually. Uh, and I think that's the that's the far horizon uh, that I'm really, really excited about. But wow, you know, talk about what it would take in the middle term to get there. Jennifer, you know, governance, governance, governance. Um, so many, so many rules, so many Senate policies and board policies would need to change. Um, but I think that's the future that we should be embracing. We should be seeing this as a, a real lift for for decolonizing our teaching practices. Thank you, Elisa. I'm actually going to follow up directly with you, but I want others to voice as well. One of the questions in the chat was, do you think AI will replace a human university instructor? Most of our audience, I think, probably falls in that category, or many of them do. Do we think in the near future, whatever you define near future, that the instructor as a university, as we know it, is going to be replaced or changed? So I give it to you first, Elisa, but in general, I'm curious. Is there an instructor bot coming, kind of taking over Jennifer's language that she used? There? <laughs> I definitely think there's an instructor bot coming. Um, I just don't know if it would actually replace an instructor. <laughs> so we already have TAs who are really, really gifted educators. Um, they can already, they could already technically teach our classes. There is still a reason that you need to interact with somebody who's been in the field for a certain number of years and done a certain number of things in a human way. And I think that we are distracting the efforts of both of the, you know, the richness of those TA interactions and the richness of the instructor interactions because of those administrative tasks that we are all stuck doing. Um, if we could offload some of those administrative tasks, then we could have much better interactions. And one of the administrator tasks is to some extent speaking the material one time. 
right? So lecturing is a bit administrative. You, you kind of tell a story, but you don't have to tell it every single semester, the exact same story, right? Um, it's not exactly that we were replaced by videos. I mean, we all made videos over COVID and we, we definitely don't just replay them. So there is something human that has to happen in the telling of, of materials. So I think what, what the job is, is to figure out what is it that we can offload to the instructor bot or whatever it becomes. And what is the special sauce that the human brings and really exploring that gap. Uh, I think that's the next thing that we have to do so that we can make the best leverage of it. But yeah, I think we'll be replaced to some extent, but hopefully the less interesting bits. So basically uh, a co-instructor not taking our jobs is what you're going for there. Um, yeah, exactly. Okay. Christina, uh, I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but there was another question related to the sustainability and society impact that you brought up and maybe you wanna follow up on, on that particular question. Uh, sure. I'll also just say yes to everything Elisa said. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think it will replace instructors. And again, going back to my fears, my worry is that people will think it can, right? And and that we're not thinking deeply enough about about the social and relational aspects of learning and teaching, right? Um, I'm not sure if anybody here is thinking that, but you know, out there in the world, uh, that's one of my fears. But okay, so um, one of the questions was a follow up uh, to the sustainability and societal impact question. And um, the person said they really enjoyed hearing the perspectives. Um, what do you envision UBC's role to be in shaping our students' ability to make these intentional decisions around when to use these tools? Um, maybe new streams, interdisciplinary programs. How can we support faculty in integrating this teaching to their classrooms? So this is just a, a wonderful question. Thank you very much. Um, so how do we shape students' ability to make intentional decisions around using these tools and how do we support faculty in, in making intentional decisions around um, using them in their teaching? And I would say um, uh, the CTL, Okanagan, and the CTLT at UBC are, are just doing a fantastic job um, uh, working uh, particularly in the faculty and, and graduate student uh, space for supporting folks to do that. Um, and I also know that there are conversations around continuing to develop further um, resources and supports around training for um, uh, education and training for students, uh, staff and, and faculty. So those are in the works, uh, continuing to think about that further. Um, I think for students, I, I, I would say this is an area that our, our committee around uh, generative AI and teaching and learning has talked about a bit that um, um, it's it's a space where uh, uh, we've we've been uh, able to have student uh, voices in there and it's been fantastic but I also feel like we could have more uh, connection to students and um, more resources particularly to support students in, in using these tools um, effectively responsibly ethically etc. So uh, again, also under discussion, stay tuned. <laughs> and certainly folks are, are involved in talking about that right now. So I would just say, excellent question, thank you. Um, there are, there's talk happening and I'm happy to hear ideas uh, from anybody at any point. Great, thank you so much for the answer. I know people cannot see the questions posted, but I'm gonna post, we have, uh, some AI attending our session right now. So I'm just gonna share on chat what the AI thinks of our um, panel that we've had so far. So thank you for participating AI, but uh, we'll decide for ourselves how we're gonna interact with you appropriately, I think would be the answer. So we only got a few minutes left. So I'm gonna ask each panelist, we basically have a futuristic question. You can take this however you want. What is your vision for UBC and AI going forward? Um, I basically ask people who want to go first now instead of the order that we have. So that future question, panelists, who wants to take the first shot on the bigger question of where we go in the future, recognizing nobody knows where we're actually going to go in the future? Volunteers? Go ahead, Ainsley. 
I think it started just to provide a little bit of a bridge from from the last question. I think it's a really important one, the, the one that Christina spoke to as well, um, because it also was part of the, the question that was about fear. And I think UBC's role is a very active one, and it's one that might look different than institutions have had before in terms of how students interact with guidelines or how guidelines and frameworks and those kind of institutional documents are received on the ground. I think it's gonna have to look really different to make those live, to make those understood and to make those continue to inform decisions in a new way. Um, so I just wanted to speak to that in terms of the connection, but what I would say in terms of the future, what, what's going to be sort of the future of this is, you know, we've said this many times that Elisa said it, this is making institutions act. Um, and I think what my vision would be, would be just that this is forcing us, and, and again, going back to something that Elisa said, it's forcing us to go back to, and I, I loved that that expression, Elisa, something human that has to happen. Um, and as someone who's been outside of the classroom for 10 years, but who did love teaching, that was the best part in many ways is that human thing that had to happen. So what is that thing that had to happen? Because we're coming out of a phase of education being more and more transactional. And I'm seeing this again from the academic integrity space. We need to move outside of that um, and move away from the sort of heritage that's carried forth from things like the pandemic and other things that preceded that. So I'd love to see things move away from that to rebuild that engagement and that, that human connection. Thank you so much. Other panelists, visions for the future. Do I need to call on you like students? Okay, Elisa, you're up. I think you do. We're all too polite. Um, so, I mean, I think I've already, I've already gone over a little bit what my, what my far future vision, I mean, what I would love to see is a real reimagining of the way that students interact with education. Um, I would love it if it was more of a pull model where students were able to engage with, with learning as, as they needed it and as worked for them. Um, right now, we very much have these pacings and we have semesters and we have exam periods and we have all of these things because we have had to industrialize and scale to thousands and tens of thousands of people. Um, is this the way that we can actually get a more human scale, even with 70,000 students? Um, so in computer science, I think we're sort of 50 to one for faculty to students, um, or, you know, you know what I mean, 50 students to one faculty. And that's kind of 10 students a day. You know, you could kind of interact with around 10 students a day in a little group. Um, and everybody could do that. And that's what you could do if you weren't having to do the large admin work of teaching 700 students in a single course. Um, what, what could we do with that? Um, probably a lot. It could probably be a really incredible experience to be able to cycle through various instructors through the, you know, through the entire department, talking about your learning, working with grad students as well in a, in a more, more personal way. So I think one of the exciting things with this is if we could say we're going to sort of deconstruct a lot of the structures that we have in place around exams, retakes, um, second chances, and accessibility, and make this a real agent of positive change in all of those areas. Just because I think so many of our systems right now we're finding are set up uh, to assume a very normative way of interacting with an institution. And, and this might give us the chance to, to assume a lot less about what students uh, what what mold students fit into. Right now we have a very specific mold that we need them to fit into because of our scale. So if we could relax that um, and really blow it open so that many different kinds of people could interact with our institution, I think that would be a huge win. Thank you so much for your, your sentiments there. Next, volunteers. Go ahead, sure. Christine. Sure, I'll jump in. <laughs> so so the first thing that came to mind when I thought about, you know, the the future, and I don't I don't like do futures. I, I find it really challenging, you know, it's really hard to know what's gonna happen. However, <laughs> the the first thing that came to mind was was just something that that I was really grappling with over the last year and a half or however long it's been. Um and that is thinking about what is it as an educator that I'm really hoping students 
get, right? What what is it? What is essential for them to learn, and how? And this is kind of basic, but how are my activities and assessments attaching to that? Now, this is something that you know a lot of us think about anyway, right? Um, but I felt like as a philosopher. What we do is we do a lot of talking in class. We do a lot of you know dialogue, but we also do a lot of writing. And this the whole thing about writing, um, and the fact that you know a lot of these tools can just do that for you really gave me a bit of an existential crisis. And it was like I had to think very carefully: why am I assigning writing? Like, what is it that writing is doing that for students um, that I feel like it still needs to do, or I could do in a different way. And, and just that, it just forced me to kind of think more carefully about my learning goals, why I'm, I'm doing the things that I'm doing. And it, it's been a really interesting sort of deeper reflection. And I'm sure this is not new. I'm sure there's a lot of faculty members out there who have been doing the same thing. But I like this idea that it, it might help us to reflect more carefully you know, on our teaching practices and and why we're doing them and what where's again, I have to keep coming back to this. Where's where's the human part? What what is it that I want the students to do as human beings in their writing and why does that matter? Um, I could talk about that for a lot, but I won't because we're on the time. Thank you so much. So we got a couple of minutes left. I'd like both Heather, Heather and Jennifer to weigh in. Whoever goes first, the second one has the last word. So who, who wants to go? I want to give Jennifer the last word. Um, okay, go ahead, Heather. Then yeah, I win. Um, and and I I you know I jumped to give Jennifer the last word without really knowing what I was going to say. So now it's awkward. But um, I think that when I saw this question about the vision for the future, and I actually want to thank who the the commenter. I don't. I know I'm not even going to see the commenter, but Laura Nelson, you commented, uh, and what you commented on was about. Um, the MOOC discussion from 10 years ago. And I am really appreciative that you did that because actually in my notes, I had written down the word MOOC question mark and wasn't sure if it was going to be safe to say it, but I know at least one person is going to understand and, and appreciate what I might be thinking. There is a part of me that quite deeply hopes this is the MOOC discussion from 10 years ago, that in the end, we hyped this up real, real hard. And actually, we all survived and it did OK. And higher education was not disrupted in a way that meant we couldn't educate anymore. Um, because I think there was a fear like MOOCs would just disrupt things badly. Uh, and we focused really a lot on that. And and so I, I appreciate you saying that because I did wonder whether I should bring it up. I brought it up now. And I'll just, I guess I'll end by saying that my kind of vision in some ways, I almost hope that this scares the crap out of all of us so that we rethink everything we do, but it it doesn't actually mess it all up terribly um, and not necessarily create a thousand really new, huge innovations that actually just makes us stop and realize that new things are going to happen, change is going to happen, and we should probably try to absorb it, deal with it, work with it. And always in the service of our students, like always in the service of what is best for our students and making sure that they leave us contributing to society in ways we hope they will and they want to. So thank you, Laura and Moose. Thank you, Heather. Jennifer, a quick soundbite to end it off, maybe? Uh, I just want to say, we're not talking, at least right now, about this being AGI, artificial general intelligence. So as such, it the lim there is limitations on what this will do. And so I go back to the digital UBC framework that, you know, Christina and Simon and others have been working on, which is to say that this is about technology enabling the mission, the vision and the objectives of the institution, which is about teaching and learning and research. So knowledge creation, knowledge translation, knowledge creation is still in the hands of the human here, as is that understanding about how to translate that knowledge. So really generative AI and these other tools are about automating that to enable us to do it better for a better student experience, for a better um, you know, capability to uh, operate as an institution. 